and Victor, all the boys are gone camping. They didn't pick a good time to go camping, but so be it. Maybe. They're in Hope, near Hope, around Lake Pondere, the east side, northeast side of Lake Pondere. Oh, my. Yeah. You can get into some country out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, let us for a prayer. Get seven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The act of faith. Oh, my God, I firmly believe that thou art one God in three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I believe that thy divine Son became man and died for our sins, and that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches, because thou hast revealed them, who canst neither deceive nor be deceived. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mary Immaculate Queen, St. Peter Celestine, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, please be seated. So I don't know what this is, maybe our eighth class, thereabouts, seventh, eighth, ninth class, on apologetics. And I would like to start with a little review of what we have covered, especially for the benefit of anyone that hasn't been here for the classes, or not all of them, and also what I would like to do today and the next two classes. So the the course, you know, of classes is called apologetics, which means how do you defend what the Catholic Church teaches? Why do we believe what we believe? And how would you answer objections of non-Catholics? So we went into um, the typical uh, Protestant objections of things such as the papacy, the Holy Eucharist, indulgences, uh, purgatory, uh, praying to the Blessed Virgin Mary and to the saints, honoring their images, and so forth. Typical Protestant uh, challenges to the Catholic religion and how, how we reply. And I was doing much of the class. I was using a Bible, and I had marked it ahead of time and reading different uh, verses that, would, that you could use to prove that particular Catholic doctrine or belief. And I also had that in notes and gave you those notes. So if anyone didn't get them, would like them, I could just print them off. So we had gone through a number of classes like that. And we want to um, remember that with Protestantism, not a real good marker, so let me grab another one. The Protest Protestantism, regardless of the denomination, they all believe in several basic fundamental principles, which is uh, the Bible alone, meaning no tradition. If it's not in the Bible, they don't accept it. They also believe in private interpretation of the Bible. And of course, these uh, principles were first set down by Martin Luther. And all believe these. Private interpretation so that you don't need a church or an authority to tell you what a particular passage means. You can read the Bible and you can figure it out for yourself. And the Holy Ghost will inspire you what it means. Which, of course, is absurd. Then why do we have literally thousands of different Protestant denominations if that's true? Because God can't contradict himself. So different denominations and different so-called reformers were fighting amongst themselves insofar as what something meant. They also um, believe in, uh, in th the way it's sometimes put is that holiness is imputed to the sinner. And that means, well, we'll, we'll just use this term you've heard, faith alone, meaning you don't need to have good works. You don't even need to be baptized, according to, I told you about this one Baptist minister that said that to me, that 
Um, as long as you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are saved already, and you're going to be saved. You know, you're saved at that moment, no matter how you live, no matter what you do. And the faith alone will save you, belief in our Lord. And as I said, this they have this idea that holiness, because of the acceptance of Christ by an individual believer, holiness is imputed It's to that person. It's kind of like putting on a nice, clean garment, clothing yourself with a, with a white robe, like the early Christians did for baptism. And Luther believed that we are all um, sinners, and we will always be sinners, and it's impossible to keep the commandments, which, of course, begs the question, then why did God give us the commandments? But, but by accepting Christ, it's like putting on a garment, and, and uh, holiness is imputed to you just because of your faith. So fundamental principles of all the Protestant groups. Now, it used to be that Protestants would be categorized according to the particular denominations. You had the Lutherans, you had the Methodists, you had the Baptists, the Presbyterians, and so forth. And you could study who founded that particular uh, denomination, what his name was, what he taught, how he differed from the others. But then each of them has broken apart into a lot of different groups. Like you hear, you might hear of the uh, Lutherans of the Missouri Synod, or this group or that group. So they, amongst themselves, even though you might have all of these Protestants that take the name Lutheran, even among themselves, they have widely differing opinions. But, as I said, that used to be the case. You'd have these different denominations. Not anymore. Now, there still are the Methodists, or the this or that. But usually you find their churches are very small, and they're gradually dying out. And what they have been replaced by is these megachurches. And these megachurches are non-denominational. And the Protestants that go to those churches call themselves or are referred to as evangelicals. So I'm sure you've heard that term often, evangelicals. And all it means is someone who believes in the Gospels. So any Christian except the Gospel as the Word of God you know, the, the four Gospels, the life of Christ. But that's where the word evangelical comes from. So now, most Protestants, and, and they still have this, but they don't worry about feeling bound in any way, shape, or form to belong to a particular denomination. They're just a non-denominational Bible study Protestants, Christians. Uh, so that's, that's just kind of a brief review of... of um, mainstream, what I would call mainstream Protestants nowadays. But what we're going to talk about today and the next two classes, and then we'll, we'll end it for the summer and start on something different next September. And I'm open for suggestions, you know, in that regard. But what I want to talk about is four uh, home-born Protestant churches that are very different from all of those. And these would be the Mormons. When I say homegrown, it is a uh, sad fact that all four of these came from the United States and have spread all over the world. So there's the Mormons. They don't like that term. They want to be called the LDS, and we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, there are the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses. Some people just call them the witnesses. Or, the, or as one woman said to me, the Jehovah's, the Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, and then there are the Seventh-day Adventists. And lastly, Christian Science, or Christian Scientists. Um, these last two were founded by women, uh, Mary Baker Eddy, in the case of Christian Scientists, and can't think of her name, the Ellen G. White, White Seventh-day Adventist. Here we have Joseph Smith and um, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Judge Rutherford. Uh, there were two guys, and I, I'll, we're going to cover that next week. So this is my plan today. We want to talk about the Mormons, and then next 
class two weeks from today, I think is June 2nd. That would be that class. And then we're going to wrap it up with one last class two weeks after that. And we'll cover both of those in that last class. Now, um, as I said, this is a, a mark of shame for us Americans that these four religions came from our country. And it's based on, you know, this idea of uh, freedom, freedom of religion, etc. And they're pretty bizarre when you, when you get into what they believe. They're very cultish. Um, they do not associate with... See, in, in normal Protestants, you could go to a Lutheran church and then this Protestant might be traveling and there's no Lutheran church and he would just go, or maybe it's more convenient to go to an evangelical or go to a Methodist or whatever. They don't really care that much. Whereas this, these groups, they disassociate from everyone else. Like the Mormons, they refer to all non-Mormons as Gentiles, the same way the Jews referred to non-Jews as Gentiles. And they teach that they are the only Christian church. And I know at least, well, I think they all do. They, they all do. It's kind of like, you know, the Catholic dogma outside the Catholic Church, there's no salvation. They would all say that, you know, Mormons outside LDS, there's no salvation and on down the line. Um, but that's not going to be the same with, you know, normal Protestants. Now, I would, I would call these groups Protestant, but it's a very uh, different type of Protestantism from what had existed before. Now, um, these, all of these really came from the, the 19th century. Mormons, I think, started in, I believe it was 1829. And Jehovah's Witnesses was later in the 1800s. And then these two were around the middle of the 1800s, middle or late. Now, I'm going to be using a book called Separated Brethren. This is by William Whalen. Matter of fact, I'll put that up here in case anyone is interested in getting a, getting a copy. Separated Brethren. And it's very good um, in that it just explains what they believe. And it goes through, like if I look at the table of contents here, it goes through all of the regular Protestants, and then it goes through these groups. Um, basic differences between Catholicism and Protestantism, Lutherans, Episcopalians, Methodists, Baptists, Disciples of Christ, United Churchmen, the Quakers, Perfectionists, Pentecostals, Seventh-day Adventists, and, it's, and so forth. And it just goes through all of these. even has like a Greek Orthodox, Old Catholics, all of these different groups. So it's very good for facts. Now, unfortunately, this book was written in the 1950s, but it's been updated since then. And this particular one is like a 1977. It's put out by our Sunday Visitor Press. And uh, so I don't know what they modified, how much they modified. In fact, sadly, at the beginning, it has a little quote from Vatican II, like, you know, endorsing Vatican II. But what it has on the Mormons is, is um, just pretty, pretty much factual who they are, what they believe, etc. Now, again, this was updated and revised in 1977, so that's how many years ago, you know, close to 50 years ago now. So a lot of these facts would be, uh, you know, out of date. But still, it says uh, the Mormons have more than 4 million people, mostly Americans, who claim the name Christian and believe that Christ preached to the American Indians after his ascension, he founded a church for them in the Western Hemisphere, that an angel revealed the history of these people on golden plates to a young man in New York in 1827 and furnished him with magic spectacles to enable him to translate the record. And that this same young man reestablished the Church of Christ, which had been wiped out in the Americas and had apostatized elsewhere. And that there is just one God, there, I'm sorry, there is not, one God, but many gods. This is what Mormons believe. There is not one God, but many gods for many worlds. That man lived with God in a previous existence, and that after death, he may become a God for his own planet. They really believe this. So reincarnation. They believe 
that we all had a previous existence, but you had to make an agreement with the God of this world to wipe out your memory of that previous existence in order to become, be born in this world, to come into this world. Uh, and they really believe all these things. Um, they believe that pig, polygamy is the divine pattern of marriage. Now, these people are called Mormons. They don't like that name. They prefer to be called Latter-day Saints. So the official name of their church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, they have, I think it's four books that they use. So there's the Book of Mormons. There are two others that Joseph Smith put together. I don't remember the names right offhand. I'll find them. And, and, and the Bible. But they say... The Bible is the Word of God properly interpreted. So in other words, the Bible cannot contradict the Book of Mormon. If it does, you're, you're misunderstanding, etc. So they claim to follow the Bible, but really the Book of Mormon is more important than the Bible. So um, there was this young man who lived in a place called Palmyra, New York, which is close to Rochester in the early 1800s. His name was Joseph Smith. And when he was, I think, 21 or 22 years old, he said that he had a vision of an angel called Moroni. And this angel explained to him what happened. So again, according to them, Jesus Christ came over here to the Western Hemisphere and founded among the American Indians another church, another Christian church. And that the one founded on the Twelve Apostles apostatized with the de shortly after the death of the last apostle. So then there were no true Christians anywhere. And then the one here lasted for a couple hundred years after Christ's ascension, but there were two big tribes of Indians. One was the Nephites and the other Lamanites, I think. But at any rate, these two tribes, bad Indians, the bad tribe defeated the good tribe and wiped them out. And the general of the Nephites was a man named Mormon, so where their name comes from. And so the bad Indians wiped them out. And so true Christianity was lost from that point up until Joseph Smith's revelations in 1827 or 1829. I think 1827 was when he claims to have this revelation, and they, they say the church started in 1829. So he claimed that this angel led him to a hill right there in, in New York and showed him a, a box, I think, of golden plates. And there, there were these golden plates and... This angel furnished him with magic spectacles to read them. Now, in, in the words of Joseph Smith, these plates were in Reformed Egyptian, which there is no such language. Matter of fact, there was a professor of, of language, ancient languages at some university, and they, people who were follow, kind of following Joseph Smith, but they were a little skeptical, wanted him to prove to this confessor that that you know, draw some of these characters, these hieroglyphics that he saw. And he just took uh, s several different things that he saw and he just put little crooked lines together and gave them. The man said, this is just a bunch of gibberish. This isn't any language at all. But he called it Reformed Egyptian. So nobody ever saw these golden plates, of course, except Joseph Smith or the magic goggles, spectacles that he used to interpret them. Now, Joseph Smith had a friend there in, um, in New York, and his name was Cowdery, something like that. Uh, and this man um, helped, helped him to write down. Oh, this, this Cowdery, Oliver Cowdery, was an unemployed school teacher. And Joseph Smith sat behind a blanket and translated to him the Book of Mormon, and he wrote down what Joseph Smith told him. And that's where they get the Book of Mormon. The interesting thing about the Book of Mormon is it has a lot of idioms taken from the King James Bible. Of course, the King James Bible didn't exist until the you know, late 1500s when it was translated into English under the Protestants in England, under King James, late 1500s or early 1600s, the King James Version. So it's really peculiar that this book or these plates that it supposedly went back to the year 400 or thereabouts. That, that that's what they had, these idioms that were word for word, what was in the King James Bible. At any rate, so it says here, 
According to uh, this book, the uh, Book of Mormon, North and South America were peopled by Jews who came by ship from Palestine. Two nations arose, the Lamanites and the Nephites. Essentially, Mormonism is based on a version of the Lost Tribes of Israel legend. Um, the Mormon Bible relates that Christ appeared among the Nephites, chose 12 Indian apostles, and set up a church which is a counterpart of the church he had established in Jerusalem. Eventually, the dissolute Lamanites destroyed the virtuous Nephites in a battle near Palmyra in 421 AD, according to Joseph Smith. Moroni, the son of the vanquished Nephite general Mormon, buried the golden plates which recounted the history of his race. The plates also recorded the history of the Jaredites who were supposed to have come to America after the Tower of Babel. After translating the reformed Egyptian, Joseph Smith delivered the plates and goggles to the angel, and they have not been seen since. Linguists know nothing about a language called Reformed Egyptian, and some of Smith's early disciples urged him to submit a specimen to a scholar in order to confound the skeptics. He copied down what he called characters and presented them to Professor Charles Anthon of Columbia College. Anthon declared the sample consisted of all kinds of crooked characters disposed in columns, evidently prepared by some person who had before him at the time a book containing various alphabets. So he combined things from different ones. Um, he repeatedly, this, um, this professor, repeatedly denied the Mormon claim that he had declared the markings to be genuine Reformed Egyptian. All right, so Joseph Smith started this little group here in a place called Palmyra, New York, not too far from Rochester. And then shortly thereafter, a couple years later, he moved to Ohio, uh, someplace in Ohio where there was a pastor of a church who joined up with him. And that man's name was, I will find it, um, Sidney Rigdon. And the two of them teamed up and were there for a while, got some more followers. And then he moved to Missouri. And Joseph Smith bought some land in Missouri and he declared that when Christ comes again in his second coming, there will be a temple built on that property. And later the Mormons had a big split and there's the bulk of them in Utah, centered in Utah. And then those that are still following the, that owned that land in Missouri. At any rate, Joseph Smith was there for a while in um, Missouri, but then he got arrested, and I think he was in jail for four months for some fraud or something. And he escaped or, or whatever, and he went to Illinois. And he founded a city in Illinois on swampy ground close to the Mississippi River, you know, on the Illinois side of the Mississippi, a place called Nauvoo, which he claimed was a Hebrew word. And he built up this city, and it had, at its heyday, it had 2,000 people. So a pretty sizable city for the state of Illinois at that time, 1840s or 1830s. But then disaster happened. He was arrested again, and he was going to be extradited to Missouri that wanted him to come back to face trial for something. And so he's, he's sitting in this jail this small, you know, county jail or city jail in Illinois, and a group of men, 200, I think, who had put, you know, blackface on or whatever to kind of disguise their identity, raided the jail and killed him and his son. So now he's dead, and there was a kind of a uh, competition for who's going to take over this Mormon religion. And the one who won out, is one you've all heard of, Brigham Young. And Brigham Young, who only had 11 days of formal schooling, Brigham Young organized them and, and started on this epic march to the West. And when they came to Salt Lake Valley, he said, this is the place. This is where we're going to set up you know, our new settlement. And uh, if you know anything about Utah, I believe the motto of Utah is it's the beehive state. And the reason for that is the Mormons were known for their industriousness. They literally made this desert bloom, Salt Lake City area. And at that time, when Brigham Young first moved there, um, it was part of Mexico. 
and then later on became part of the United States. And there was this, there was this um, opposition between Brigham Young and his followers and the United States government because, of course, Brigham Young promoted uh, polygamy. In fact, he had at least 27 wives. And I say this because the book mentions that his 27th wife ended up leaving and, and you know, turning against him and, and basically divulging some of the things going on and so forth. But Brigham Young set up shop there. He was the undisputed uh, person in charge of the Mormon religion, and they began to grow and spread and so forth. Now, Mormons, uh, you know, are... Um, they, they attract a lot of people. And you think, why is that? Why do they attract uh, people? They have this appearance of being clean cut, you know, very um, well mannered, industrious, etc. And they require their young men to go on a mission to give two years of their lives after they graduate from high school or college to spend two years as missionaries. And they go all over the world. And so they have gotten a lot of converts everywhere. And um, Brigham Young became what was called the president. And the way the Mormon church is set up is you have this man, he's called a seer, a prophet, a president, but they have a man in charge, kind of like the idea of a pope. You know, they have one man in charge. And the interesting thing is he can receive revelations from God. So just, you know, a pope can't change doctrine. But in the Mormon church, their president can change doctrine. So one thing that's a little interesting tidbit, is Mormons have always taught that you can't have alcohol or tobacco or coffee or tea. They're, they're forbidden, the Mormon religion. And it used to be cola drinks, carbonated drinks, you know, cola was not permitted until the Mormons bought a huge share of the Coca-Cola company. And then he had a revelation that now Coca-Cola could be you know, could be consumed by, by Mormons. They also used to forbid uh, black people, African Americans, to have any position. They couldn't be, uh, they could be in the church, but they couldn't have any position of authority, etc. And then, you know, they got a lot of pressure because of that. And so one of their presidents finally, you know, middle of the 20th century, had a revelation that now the African Americans who are Mormons now could become, be married in the temple or whatever. So Mormons have three steps uh, in the religion. One is baptism, and then they have what they call the endowment. And the endowment would be similar to confirmation. It's like for young, you know, teenagers, and they go through a ceremony. It's a, it's a lengthy ceremony, and it can only be done, as I understand, in a temple. And Unless they're endowed, they can't be married in a temple. And they call their marriage in the temple marriage for time and eternity. And there's another thing called marriage for time. But if you get married and you marry another Mormon and it's in the temple, then it's a marriage for time and eternity. Now that just reminds us of what our Lord said. Remember the Sadducees were talking about a man had different wives or a wife had different husbands and they died. And in heaven, who's who shall she be the wife of, of those different men that she had married? And our Lord said, in heaven they shall be like the angels of God. There is no marrying in heaven or giving in marriage. They shall all be like the angels of God. But not so for the Mormons. There is marriage in time and eternity. Another big thing about Mormons, they, they believe that there are three stages of heaven, basically. There is the celestial heaven, there is the terrestrial heaven, and the telestial heaven. And depending on, you know, different people can go to different, different ones. But if you're a really good Mormon, you can get to the celestial heaven. But I think you have to have uh, a marriage in the temple. But one of the things Mormons do that's very interesting is they baptize by proxy the dead. So if you want your dead relatives, who were not Mormons, to get to heaven, you can do your genealogy research and you can be baptized again for them. By proxy, they're getting baptized, the dead, by you going through the ceremony on their behalf. And they said it's nothing for a, a Mormon to go to the temple or wherever 
and to get baptized 30 times in a day in an afternoon for 30 of his relatives who died centuries ago. And some Mormons claim to be able to trace their family tree back to like the year 500 AD. And you probably know this, that you can go on to Ancestry.com or one of those, but you also can go to the Mormons. They have a big Ancestry Center in Salt Lake City, and they have they have more information than just about anybody else. They're very big on genealogy because they want to know who their deceased ancestors are so they can save them, get them baptized so they can, you know, get to heaven. Um, the, the ceremony of endowment, it was saying in here, is very, um, um, very similar to Freemasonry. Now, the interesting thing about Freemasonry, the Book of Mormon forbids entrance into the Freemasons. But Joseph Smith himself and Rigdon, that was the first uh, man that really supported him in Ohio, at this, some church in Ohio, they were both members of the Freemasonry, but they got kicked out. So, uh, but the point I bring it up is there are a lot of secret things. They have a secret handshake, a little things that they do in this endowment ceremony. And there are secrets that they don't divulge. And I have to, you know, I didn't have it all marked off. I read this, but I want to find this one thing. This endowment, they take, aha, uh -huh, let me just see what it says here. In the day-long endowment rites, young Mormons are initiated into the, into the esoteric aspects of the cult. The endowment ceremony usually precedes the marriage rites. Participants enter the temple with their temple vestments of white shirt and trousers, white robe and girdle, cloth cap, moccasins, and a Masonic type green apron with fig leaf design. So it makes you think of the, of the Freemasons, you know, they wear an apron. All right, the first, they first bathe and are anointed with oil. After this, they don their long white underwear, and it's an LDS approved underwear that you can only get at an LDS store where they have these. And believers wear that all their lives and they're buried in it. This undergarment's approved by the LDS church. Uh, three symbols are stitched in these undergarments that signify that if the initiate, initiate should reveal temple secrets, he will allow his legs to be amputated, his intestines disemboweled, and his heart cut out. And Mormons are buried in that garb if they divulge what goes on in the temple. Now, you can go to Salt Lake City and you can go into the, you know, the main room where they have the Mormon Tabernacle Choir sing or whatever. Um, you can go there, but they will never take a non-Mormon into, you know, these secret rooms, etc. So what they said that this, the symbols that are stitched into their, their Mormon underwear symbolize that if you reveal the secrets, you, you know, you're... You're, you realize and you accept the fact that you will be, uh, you know, killed in that way. That is exactly like a Freemasonic oath. Freemasons will say, if I should ever divulge, you know, the secrets of Masonry, may my heart be cut out and my, you know, ashes scattered to the four winds and this and that and the other thing. So very, very interesting here, very similar. Now, um, there was a great scandal in Mormon history that, likely young Mormons don't know anything about, and they don't tell them, or if they do, they probably gloss it over and change it around. But it is called the famous Mountain Meadow Massacre. Have any of you heard about that? The Mountain Meadow Massacre. That take place, took place in 1857. So there were a group of 120 um, pioneers that were on their way to the, you know, the, gold, the gold fields in California, in search of gold, moving west. And they came through Salt Lake City. And um, there was a Mormon bishop named John Lee. And he and his men persuaded them, we will accompany you because we know the territory and we'll protect you from the Indians. But you need to turn all your weapons over to us. And these poor people did. And when they got out into this thing called the Mountain Meadow, they were just all assassinated there. Now, Mormons believe in what's called blood atonement. And blood atonement means there are certain evil deeds you have done, and the only way to, to wipe them out is through blood. And so this was in a case of blood atonement, apparently. Uh, let me read a little more about it. 
Um, these pioneers agreed to the arrangement, but at the signal from Bishop Lee, who said, do your duty, men, the Mormons murdered the men, hacked the women to death, and kidnapped the children. Twenty years later, Lee, who had been a Catholic in his youth, was convicted and executed. The role of Brigham Young, who was in charge in Salt Lake City in this affair, has never been ascertained. That the blood atonement has been suggested by some Gentile historians, non-Mormon historians. You know, uh, other Mormons might say that it was just this one wicked man and, you know, had nothing to do with their doctrines, but they believe in that blood atonement. Now, Mormonism, Mormons are very, very wealthy, or, or their, their church is very wealthy. They own, now this is again 50 years ago, it says, uh, a member who does not contribute 10% of his income to the church does not qualify as a good a Mormon in good standing. Uh, a source of income provides the cult with huge sums for missionary activity, educational programs, building, and other enterprises. Mormon businessmen undertake major church constructions during times of um, unemployment, etc. And it says, uh, all right, talks about young men going out. I wanted to find, they have a whole list here of the things they owned back then. But they owned an airline, they owned Marriott hotels. You know, I was on, uh, you know, Silver Mountain, you go, go up a gondola to get up there. And I was going up with the boys a few years ago. And um, I was in one of the cars and the other people can come in, you know, they try and fill up the car and I, for six, six or eight people. And there was a man there and he was Mormon. And he was bragging to me that Super One Foods is owned by a Mormon. Of course, that shouldn't be any surprise at all because there are a lot of Mormons in our area. Uh, not so much as in Southern Idaho. If you go down to Southern Idaho, outside of Boise, so Boise is, you know, a big city, so all different religions. But if you get down to, you know, Idaho Falls and, and uh, some of those cities down in Southern Idaho, um, very, very highly Mormon you know, density of Mormon population in those cities. So Utah and then Southern Idaho. Um, there was uh, literally the United States, it might have been under Abraham Lincoln, but one of the presidents sent an army to Salt Lake City to force the Mormons to give up polygamy. And they finally agreed, but they call it a suspended doctrine. So they still believe that it's lawful in the eyes of God, but they had to give it up because they wanted to become a state. And they became the 45th state, and that was part of the agreement that they would give up the practice of, of polygamy. However, there are groups of Mormons who are offshoots who still believe it and still practice it, especially in northern Arizona. And believe it or not, there's one right here locally in northern Idaho, I think in the Bonners ferry area. There's a group of Mormons that practice polygamy. So it's, you know, uh, something practiced um, a lot. Now, um, I mentioned that um, Brigham Young had 27 wives, but that was nothing compared to uh, Kimball, what was his name? And he had 45 wives. So, you know, this is part of their religion. Um, so Mormons, it's, it's, um, a lot is borrowed free from Freemasonry. They say they're Christian. They say they believe in the Bible. But again, they believe in a multitude of gods. Now, just chew on this for a minute. This is from Brigham Young. This is a saying of Brigham Young. What man is now, God once was. What God is now, man may become. So if you're a good Mormon, you'll get your own planet and you'll be a god of your own planet and your own people, and you'll be in charge of that, that planet. And they actually believe that the god of this planet is Adam, by the way. You know, our first parent, Adam. So, uh, you know, just very, very strange ideas. And I've only, you know, I read through this and just kind of uh, just scratching the surface of some of the things that they... Uh, by the way, I came across Mormons, too, in reading the life of Father DeSmet, because he actually went with that army... And he prevented bloodshed because, you know, these, this general, they, they were ready to just, uh, you know, fight the Mormons and, and destroy them if they didn't accept uh, giving up polygamy. And that, that was how it was viewed at that time. And, and Father DeSmet interceded and prevented bloodshed. Uh, so that's another interesting, interesting fact. So 
uh, that's that's pretty much it. It says uh, it talks about the, the two different main groups. There's the the main group in um, in Salt Lake City that's concentrated in Salt Lake City, but the one that's back in Missouri is called the Reorganized Church, um, and it is somewhat closer to Christianity. They deny polygamy, blood atonement, temple worship, baptism of the dead, and the Adam God doctrine. So that's that group in Missouri. They still claim to follow Joseph Smith. And by the way, they claim to be the, the head of their church as a descendant of Joseph Smith. That's why they broke away. When Brigham Young took over, they said, no, it has to be, has to be a lineal descendant of Joseph Smith. So that is at least at the time that this book was written. So a very strange religion, but very uh, populous. And one of the things that brings people into Mormonism especially over the last 50 years since Vatican II, is we've had the breakdown in morality, and people see Mormons as being decent, as being, you know, well-mannered, uh, well-dressed, etc. And the thing that Mormons will do, and they have here, <laughs> in fact, my brother, Father Brendan, when he was in uh, high school, uh, because he was good at milking cows, you know, they, my other brother had you know, cows he milked, and Father Brendan in high school would milk the cows. There was a Mormon farm real close to them, and every now and then they'd call him up and ask him if he could come over and milk the cows because, you know, the person they were going to have to do it couldn't do it or whatever. But the point is that he said that on this farm they had huge stores of uh, supplies for an emergency. And what the Mormons will do is they will take care of their own. They will, uh, you know, this is how they bring people in. Somebody is down on their luck, they'll help them out. And they kind of win people over that way. But they're very wealthy. They believe, I mean, the, the churches, the religion is that the church of Mormon, they own, uh, as I said, you know, they owned an airline that's been sold. That was Western Airlines, used to be based in Salt Lake City, and that was bought out by Delta, and that's why Salt Lake City is now a Delta hub. But the Mormons owned that airline. And the Marriott Hotels and, you know, different things. Um, of course, Brigham Young University is the largest by population um, university that is based on a denomination. They have three times the population of, say, Notre Dame University in Indiana at Brigham Young, BYU. 97% of the students at BYU are Mormons. So, uh, you know, that they're trained, they're get, they get their classes, they're trained to be good Mormons. So it's a very strange religion, um, sadly, one that has ensnared many people, including many former Catholics after Vatican II, people left the religion. And we'll find that the same is true with these other groups. So that's about it. If you want to learn more, this is a good book uh, to read, but we'll, we'll end it there, and I'll see you if you want to come in two weeks. We'll talk about Jehovah's Witnesses. All right? how about a blessing? We'll end with a blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis patris et filiat spiritus sancti descendat super vos et maniat semper. Amen. Okay. Thank God for our faith. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just I unbelievable. Mean, in Salt Lake City, oh. you're from